Right, well, as Adrian said, um, we had the questions before we provided the answers, but um, what I'd like to do is we had a second presentation, and we're just going to show two slides from it, and then we go on to the questions. And what happens is the questions that we've been asked are in sort of five categories. So what we'll do is we'll go through them by category, and then at the end of each category, we'll ask if there are any more questions in that particular category. And if people feel their question isn't in any of the categories, then please scream, because the outliers are the things that one could be really interested in. So we just wanted to show a couple of what we call Battenbergs. We did quite a lot of Battenbergs in the 1990s, which essentially covered two by two matrix. And one of them was when we started to bring the technical and the human factors together. And we were saying, we've got this little thing that designed for manageability. We've got physical variables, we've got behavioral variables. And they can either be context free, so you can apply them everywhere, or they're context dependent, so it depends very much when or where they're actually applied. And so what you get is you get four quadrants. And so you get here physical context free, Yes, yeah, saying, what you want to say, fit and forget, you know. It'd be nice if you didn't have to think about falling through the floor in this room, you know. So essentially, it's sort of structural engineering and things. That you, the number of things that you can lock down and you can say, if we've got the formula and if we do it properly, then it's there and it needs little or no maintenance. But what so often happens, so... You know, you make it invisible. You know, what people really like about buildings is buildings they don't have to think about. They just sit there and let them do what they want to do. They don't get in the way. But you get over this side and you're saying it's context dependent. So, you know, it's night. We don't need the heating on. Um, you know, it's summer, we need to cool it. You know, things, like things that move around, there are people in here, you know. People have come in with lots of wet clothes, etc. What are we going to do with them? So essentially here there's an issue about implementation and management making usable. Now what we found again and again was that designers promoted technical solutions as if they were fit and forget, but they weren't. They had an enormous, often vigilance, overhead that came with them. And what one also finds is you can get a terrible conspiracy between designers on WYSI stuff and senior management of organizations on WYSI stuff. You, we all know about the chief executive who procures a fantastic building and then his firm goes bankrupt. I mean, just look at Royal Bank of Scotland, for example. Remember that? You know, move the whole headquarters next door to the airport. You know, have an oyster bar and whatever that is. You know, it's gone. You know. So you get these terrible conspiracies sometimes. So then you've got this bit, which is context-free, but behavioral. So that's about what people do. Now, there are certain things about what people do which you can take for granted, or at least in a structured society. You know, we don't go around in this room suddenly stabbing knives into each other or things like that. So there's a, there's a whole habits being the flywheel of society, as was put by Michael Young in a book he wrote called The Metronomic Society about 25 years ago. It was saying how what used to cycle with the seasons and with the days was becoming in human life for the 24-7 society. And he predicted that time would go off the market. And I must say, having seen 25 late, years later the time pressures that come to you by electronic communications, I really feel that time has gone off the market. But anyway, so you have to make it habitual. Now what we find again and again is designers say, we did something marvelous, but it's the idiots who are in there that have made a mess of it. And we say, no, 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 you didn't understand what the people in there had as their objectives of their understanding in terms of using the building. In fact, it's interesting. We were talking about this, and I talked about a designer, um, an engineer, and he said, you know, I really, really like that. You know, when you first produced it, I think in 97 or something, we first produced this diagram. I, mean, I tuned into it, you know, in the late 90s, but it wasn't until the last few years that I started going to the buildings I designed and realizing what I thought was usable and manageable was not. You know, the perception of the designer was very different from the perception of the user and manager. 
And then you've got this area where it's behavioral and it depends on context. And suddenly, you know, things can change. I mean, if you think about the change, for example, to thinking about security in buildings following 9-11, you know, all sorts of things, you know, suddenly flip. And what you've got to do there is make things acceptable and robust. And so often, one finds that things are based on misplaced concreteness. So, I mean, look at, for example, the recent program of PFI schools and hospitals. They were based on a very, very precise brief for something that had to last a very long time and got locked in to a whole lot of preconceptions. I mean, we're now likely to lock the whole energy supply industry into a whole lot of preconceptions, too. The area where there's not enough elbow room in these things. Now, Adrian, do you want to add anything? To that, since it was very much this was one of the first things that came out of Adrian and me coming together and thinking, you know, what can we make of this in a way that people can understand it simply? Make usable. <laughs> I think that's all. Is that all? I have it upside down. There are a couple, a couple of things here. I mean, th this is one of those diagrams that we don't use that often, but we want to use it with a group like you because it's slightly abstract and you're going to have to strain your brains a little bit to get your heads around it. And it's the kind of stuff that isn't immediately familiar. Now, one of our light bulb moments is embedded in here, and which is the top right-hand corner, make usable. But a lot of this stuff is nearly obvious. And when we talk about, when I talk about some of the behavioral uh, user-related usability, manageability stuff, especially to architects, they kind of sit there saying, well, tell me something I don't know. Now, the thing, one of our light bulb moments is all we've used the phrase design intent several times. And one of the light bulb moments is, if occupants, of buildings understand design intent, that is how things are supposed to work, they will A, be more liable to tolerate faults, and B, they will like it better. Now that isn't a recipe for, for architects then to produce crappy buildings, but if you do produce a crappy building, but, but people understand how it is supposed to work, they will actually regard it as more usable and like it more. And this relates to earlier and to one of the questions coming later, the relationships between pro effectiveness, productivity, and control. You know, now, one of the real dangers of this kind of work is that it gets boiled down to myths. And one of the myths is that all you have to do is make things more usable and everything's going to be all right. And we've known that. Since at least since the 1930s, Donald Mo Norman knew it for Apple in the 1980s, and they based, based their whole strategy around this incredible usability. And Donald Norman is now probably spinning in his grave as he sees some of the stuff coming out recently because it contradicts some of the usability principles. Now, the thing about it is, if people understand how things are supposed to work, they will like it better. Like sash windows are completely obvious what you have to do. You, 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 know, you, you can understand how they work, you understand the mechanisms, you get immediate response on whether they're working or not, except that they're not that brilliant in terms of the, the actual response they provide, and they tend to be becoming more and more obsolete because of uh, you know, various health and safety and other physical aspects to them. But they embody great usability. Now, Usability is something that's banded around but hardly ever done. If you go into British practice and say which practices, architectural or design practices, do you go to for a usable building, nobody knows the answer. Now, just come down to the bottom left-hand corner, make habitual. Bill used this great quote from Michael Young, Habit is the flywheel of society. 
And there's an awful lot said now about all you have to do is change behaviour and everything's going to be all right. When people say that, I come out, I kind of come out in eczema and, and, start, and start getting really quite irritated because they think, they think behaviour is like another technology. It isn't. Make habitual, for example. I, when, I've been in three hotel fires. And now, when I'm in a hotel, I put all my stuff on a chair by the door so that if, if the alarm goes off, I'm, it's like something out of Wallace and Gromit. I get straight into the trousers and I'm out there, right? And I have a torch. I always carry a torch now. Because I was caught in a fire in New Zealand and, you know, I was groping around the floor trying to get out of this place. Now, the thing is, on the wall there's instructions about what to do, except that they don't work. Because my understanding of a hotel, which I'm in for a day, won't be a habitual understanding, it'll be a one-off. I don't know the layout, especially in the dark and in the smoke, and when you're slightly stressed, because there's a bloody great alarm going off. But, you know, it's much... Now, one of the things we're saying is, please think in these terms. Do not try and push everything into the context-free category, which is what people are trying to do all the time. The market wants everything to be context-free. All the corporations want you to buy their stuff. They will then con you know, control all the variables if they want to. In fact, things are far more context-dependent and, of course, buildings themselves, by definition, are context dependencies. And th th this, is, this is kind of abstract. We keep thinking, why haven't people taken this up more? Because we think this stuff is really important, and yet nobody has really... It doesn't ever, ever often get quoted, whereas uh, lots of our other stuff does. But it's not so important. This is important to us. And um, I think Bill's got one more Battenberg to share. Well, I think we just got approached by the editor of Building Research and Information, who published this paper 15 years ago, saying, I want to republish it. You know, so these sort of things happen. Now, I have got another Battenberg, but I'm not sure whether Go I should on, show it, because I think we want Questionbergs, actually. But um, let's just whiz through this Battenberg. This, this is actually the implication of something is that you can have more or less complicated buildings, and they need more or less management input. And as we saw from the studies we showed you in the previous session, we had some buildings that worked very well, which were both complicated and highly managed. We also, like Woodhouse Medical Center, had buildings that worked very well, which were not complicated and need very little management. You also find occasion that there are buildings that get more management than they deserve and work astoundingly well. And that's probably Elizabeth Fry before they bedded it down. And it can be sometimes, you know, people who built their own houses or whatever, etc. So they really understand what it's about. They can really do stuff. You find quite a lot of demonstration projects can sort of end up in that area. So, you know, it looks great as far as the result, but what you don't realise is the degree of TLC that's gone through the whole thing. Now, what we found essentially is there tends to be a pressure to promote this type of building, a high-performance building. So all this whizzy technology is going to get us out of trouble. But there's another area down here. I call it simple smart. Sue Rofe, um, calls it sense and science. It's where you get things together in a thoughtful and intelligent way. So you minimize the amount, particularly of this bespoke kit, that you need. Problem here is that if you have a sort of demonstration project, Thing, that the danger is in the wrong hands, that it drops down into this cell here, where it's got less support than it needs, which is where Adrian and I first met in terms of Adrian's problems with people being unhappy in air-conditioned buildings, particularly in the public sector, where the public sector couldn't afford the management to look after the air-conditioned building. But now, of course, the public sector is aping the private sector, so it has many more of these types. Now, the problem is, high performance, again, as we saw with Tanfield House, which was actually about a sort of corporate thing rather than the technical. If you're not careful, they fall into this cell. So what we were saying, you know, 
when we wrote this, this was in, in, in program view sort of 13, 14 years ago, is don't put public buildings in this box. Now look at the Buildings for Schools for the Future program and things like that. We have got nearly all the public buildings produced in the last 10 years are in that box. They're all dressed up and nowhere to go. The demand of the buildings for support is unaffordable in the economy we're now in. One knew that. Economies go up and down. Public buildings have to go on and on. Senate House, I understand, down the road, um, was built with a lifespan of 500 years. I don't know whether it was. And certainly when you look at some of the details, you find, well, I don't think that would last 500 years. But nevertheless, I've seen a big change in universities over the last 20 years for seeing themselves you know, in it for the long term to a business like everybody else, which isn't necessarily a good idea for university premises. This the refurbishment of the Energy Institute, perhaps. Anyway, so the whole thing of, well, you know, let's have... If you've got type A, lock it down. Make sure it's not fragile. You know, try and get more type Bs. Try and get more things that are thoughtfully done so that people have to run less hard to stand still and keep out of the unmanageable complication area. So, anyway, having absorbed 15 minutes of the discussion slot and only having 40 minutes left, I think we'd better go into the discussion, don't you, Adrian? So... These were the subject areas we had for people who submitted questions in advance. And, I mean, you don't have to jump now, but if anybody feels they've got a question that's outside those particular topics, then please either put your hand up now and we'll try and deal with it, or think about it while things are happening and jump up and down later. So, shall I just charge on? Right, so... The first ones relate to performance gap. Now, we made a big mistake here, because we were talking about this, ooh, late 90s, and we actually produced a paper in 2004 closing the credibility gap, but we called it credibility gap, and I think that was too threatening. It's now called performance gap, which is rather less threatening, so that's got tra traction. Now, here's the first lot of questions. So, We'll start responding to it, Adrian and I. Um, and where did the microphone go? I hope we're being recorded. Yes, we can take this on. I've been getting near this. You keep the microphone. I'm just wondering a bit about the audio. That's probably the simplest thing. If you just speak right, if I take that and we can go. This is simple. Um, yes, yeah, simple technology here. Here we go. And is, is, is it on? Yep, it is. Okay. Right. So, is an 0% performance gap possible? Well, no, not really, because the world moves on. I think the issue is that, I mean, I'm rather worried about the probabilistic approach. I mean, this is where carbon buzz seems to have come from. You know, what they're saying is we can start with the sort of regulated loads which designers understand. And then in the rest of it, here be dragons. You know, we really don't know what happens. So what we've got to do is sort of think about what the probability is of us falling down an elephant trap. I mean, I think there's an area where you can get more into virtuous circles because the problem is in-use performance is related to all sorts of variables, not just the design and delivery of the building, but, you know, what people are doing in it what the landlord-tenant arrangements are, all sorts of things for different buildings. And what you want to do is get something which is actually focusing on that performance and trying to improve it, so you get the virtual circles to get better and better. And that means better communication between all the parties. But you're unlikely ever to get it down to, you know, not, well, certainly you're not going to get down 0% from design intent to actuality, because apart from some probably industrial production plants and things like that. There's nothing that you could be quite so predictable about how the building is going to be used. But what you can do is develop a language in talking about it where people can own the problems that they need to and expectations can be managed into more assured performance and more assured performance improvement. What realistic changes in policy my view is that policy is at the moment circling around actual performance. 
we tried, starting, believe it or not, 13 years ago, to get display energy certificates, which were just coming through the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive at the time, which was published in the beginning of 2003, we said, if you make performance visible and actionable, then things will happen. So essentially, we got the display energy certificates there, but what we didn't realize was that the Department of Communities and Local Government would throw away the key. So essentially, having got something where you could be there, there's been no investment in improving the benchmarking of them. They haven't expanded them to the commercial sector, which they were supposed to go out on consultancy to in 2006. They went out on consultancy on two, consultation in 2010. The consultation came back and said we liked it. They buried that. We then had lobbying from the UK Green Building Council, from the Better Buildings Partnership, even from a confederation of British industry, British Property Federation, saying we want display energy certificates. All we need is better benchmarking nearly got through in 2011 in the energy bill and the treasury booted it into touch. And then it nearly got through in the next version of the energy bill last year and then the treasury booted it into touch again. So we've got this ridiculous stuff that a display energy certificate on the Energy Performance Buildings Directive, which could focus everything on actual energy performance, is regarded by the mandarins as gold plating a European directive. What do you see as the main difference between residential and commercial? The thing about commercial is there are managers there. And essentially, if the managers are better informed, as we saw for some of the early case studies, they can actually begin to drive things in really good directions, even if they're not technically literate. I mean, we've found you know, personnel managers and things who are really into stuff. They could get the system to work by just keeping on asking the awkward questions until they get there. So in the residential sectors, you know, there's much more, you know, English man's home in his castle and the rest of it, there's much more difficulty in motivating things when people are there. So you can't really do that through the management. What you can do is you can make things more fit and forget, more, um, more usable, you know, more going with the habits in, in, in domestic buildings than we tend to have. I mean, it's not been an enormous disconnect between the providers of domestic buildings and the users. You know, they've often been ticking the boxes on the fabric when it doesn't work. You know, all this internal lining and the rest of it, which they tend to like for insulation in terms of constructability is hopeless generally for summertime temperatures and air infiltration. So a whole area there that you can bolt things down. And then you're in the area of the social landlords. And the social landlords, well, the management is there. But on the other hand, the management isn't usually terribly well resourced in terms of money because there's not very much they can charge to their tenant. So again, you need the robust solution. So how should POE be tailored for different building use sectors? Well, we, we got into domestic about, what, five or six years ago, and I think it was Fionn Stevenson, who was at Oxford Brooks and now um, is professor at Sheffield University. And I mean, one of the big problems in domestic is being able to talk to and access the occupiers, because that can be very difficult for all sorts of of methodological reasons, and also you might get bitten by the Rottweiler or whatever. So there are, there's a different way of approaching domestic from non-domestic. But you'll find that there was actually a building research and information, what, a couple of years ago now, wasn't there, on housing evaluation, where some of that comes up. So anyway, I've probably been talking too much, actually. I think we're going to go a lot quicker. But do you want to say anything, Adrian, before I sign off on this slide? We've got about 15 slides, and I took five minutes on that one. So we're going to have to get a bit faster. Yeah, I'll one try and be quite time. quick. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the two of, one of uh, I've been thinking ahead, not really listening to Bill, trying to think ahead of the next question in case he's asked me to say something. So um, I, I don't really want to talk about the first one, but the last two. How should POE investigations be tailored for different building use sectors? Well, there are only two sectors, as far as I'm concerned, which is domestic and non-domestic, and Bill's covered that. I think that. When we put together the original Building New Studies questionnaire, it was a generic questionnaire. We didn't differentiate between all the sectors, which tend to be classified very arbitrarily anyway. 
you know, if we get a, an email saying, have you got a, a questionnaire for the retail sector or the health sector? The answer is yes, we've got the building use studies questionnaire because most buildings are pretty similar from a user point of view. Now, and one of the things in, in question is you don't ask questions that you already know the answer to or that the, the users don't know the answer to. So if you're interested in trickle ventilators, you don't ask questions like that in a user questionnaire. That's too specialist. Now, the other thing about the residential sector, and this is really important from, from my perspective, is that you'll change people's lives. You, one of the questions that we have in the new domestic questionnaire, and it's only been, as Bill said, only been around five years, because nobody at all was doing any domestic POE five years ago. And we, we, uh, we've never had funding for the development of the questionnaire anyway. Now, what you find is that, this, you ask people, has, has, have you changed your lifestyle as a result of living here? And often we, these questionnaires are used in allegedly green or new developments. And one of the heartwarming um, answers is yes, they have. That in a truly green building, there's going to be a virtuous circle which includes diet and exercise and all the virtuous things in life. And it may also include behavior and things like that. We don't need to pick up on that. All we know, what we do know is that there is a, one, there, there, there is a, a wonderful effect if you, and you are affecting people's lives if you can make houses warm and affordable. Those are the critical things. You don't have to worry about mechanical ventilation and heat recovery and all the rest of it, you know, even if it doesn't work and the users haven't a clue how it works. What matters to them is that it's affordable, it's warm, and that they can then get on with their lives. So many houses, and they're, they're everywhere in Britain, actually are massive constraints on people's lives. That's the big difference, you're dealing with people's lives. And do it right, and you're you know, making a big, a big contribution. I'll shut up on that. Yeah, I mean, we could, on, on all of these things, we can go on for hours. Yeah. So we'll try and just keep it under control. But I mean, given that we've only got half an hour left, it would be nice to be a bit more interactive if we can too. So we'll try that um, moving on, I think. We've probably spent long enough on this. People and buildings, this is really one for you, Adrian, isn't it? Do you want to start or should I kick it off? Yes. Um, sorry, I do, you do get neck ache uh, on the front row. Uh, well, uh, come around and look at the screen from here. But I, I, I'm not going to answer all of these. I'm just going to answer the one on control, I think, because this is, this is one of those kind of light bulb things. Um, with, this is a, roughly the third bullet point, roughly, in the vicinity <coughs> of. The thing about con people and control is that they don't like sitting in the back, back seat of a car. They much prefer driving or sitting in the front seat as the second best option. They don't like sitting in the back. I don't. I don't like sitting, I like sitting by, in the aisle seat, um, near a door. Not because I'm claustrophobic, but because it gives me a little bit more, a few more options, a few more control, especially when things go wrong. Now, the thing about control in buildings is that it doesn't matter if people have no control if nothing goes wrong because they don't need it but if things do go wrong you know, it's too noisy or it's too hot or whatever it is then they need some way of alleviating that now it can either be through a help desk and a facility manager and some kind of management response or it can be a physical response through a device a control device of some sort. And as long as they get some kind of payback from the, either the help or the operation of the control, which is in their favor, they'll be happy. The, right, come, a question coming in here. Um, I need a, mic need you mic need a microphone for it. And you have to remember that we are, you know, old and deaf. Um, 
I have, the, I have a group of facilities managers who are using or trialling um, apps for phones to give this degree of control to employees um, so they can immediately report and centrally log things that are going wrong in a building. Have you had any um, or carried out well, any research been, using these apps? Uh, people have been doing that ever since technology was invented, actually. You know, probably t telegraphers and Morse code would have had that some kind of system, and they gradually... I don't know, telephone systems, help desk systems, apps, and so on. Now, um, and there have been an enormous number of experiments done with this type of approach, some of which are completely reasonable and some of which are hilarious. Now, I'm thinking of the Carnegie Mellon workstation of, in, the, in the hilarity catalogue if you look there to look that one up. Now, the thing here is that I, I would imagine that there are probably 100 people around the world developing apps for facility management looking at either occupation or control. At some point, one or two of them may be any good, and they will actually you know, capture all the variables that need to be captured in that particular situation. But now we're in the, this, the territory we're in now is something Bill and I were talking about yesterday. In order, f and this is, this is more general than this answer, in order for technologies to work well, they, they normally have a niche. Now, there'll be certain technologies that work brilliantly in certain circumstances. And the example we were using yesterday was the electric milk float. All, which is now all but extinct, and you probably, some of you don't even know what they are. Electric vehicles, three-wheel vehicles, where the milkman would come around in the morning and deliver milk to the houses in a locality. Now, that, that bit of technology, now extinct, even in the age of electric vehicles, which is slightly odd, was absolutely perfectly suited to that niche. It was quiet, you could charge them up overnight, they had one delivery run, and only the sound of the milk bottles rattling would wake you up in the morning. Now, that worked brilliantly in that niche. That niche is now gone. Now, the thing about a lot of technology in buildings, especially the, 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 the ones in one of our Battenbergs, the, you know, the demonstration ones, the demonstration buildings are about fixing the niche to make things appear to work. As soon as you take them out of the demonstration category and put them into the real world, you're changing the niche. Or as in the case of the Elizabeth Fry building, where Bill showed the ten reasons why this building worked, they then attempted to repeat that in the next building. And five of the variables came down butter side up, and the other five came butter side down or whatever. You know, they could reproduce five, but they couldn't reproduce the ten. Now, sorry, this is slightly long, but it, what I'm saying is that if this, if this app captures the context properly and reflects the niche properly and does the job, great. But the chances of that happening, to use a probabilistic approach to the, to the question, are quite low. Shall we take this one? Wait yeah, for the okay. mic. It's a bit continuing in, into that. Um, I'm working in the University of Exeter. I'm a PhD student. And we're looking in my group about energy literacy. And uh, it's, it's an interesting case that if you, for example, ask an audience how much a uh, text message costs in a mobile phone, or what's the scheme that they use to pay the internet, or things like that, they will be very literate about that. But probably if you asked an audience how much a kilowatt hour cost and how that reflects that enough to heat up a room or to heat a, heat a house, um, it would be quite, most of the people won't know. Um, so what's your opinion about actually the necessity of educating um, occupants in really knowing what energy is before moving towards... Well, it was a bit like when William Hague said yesterday that um, if, if in Britain, as long as you're not breaking the law, you don't have anything to worry about in respect of the CIA and the United States. And everybody said that's slightly patronising. I think that with... If you start 
talking about educating building users, that in itself can be patronising. It's a bit like saying, this is where you need affordances. Affordances are, um, are, are things like a chair and almost invites you to sit on it. The other things you can do with the chair, you can do lion taming with the chair, you can pick it up and use, use it for, for lion taming and stand on it to do the roof, but they're not that good. Now, as long as the, building, the building's affordances lead the user to do the appropriate things from an energy point of view, like you know, having the boiler controls in an accessible place that, where they can actually see what's happening rather than in the cellar, or as ever at um, you know, a, a, a waist height, then that's fine. But they, 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 you need to work on the usability and the affordances. You don't necessarily need to educate them to use a chair. It's, it's, it should be self-evidently obvious. Now, what, the danger is that you might be using professional criteria where we all understand what kilowatt hours are. But does you know, my granny understand what kilowatt hours are? No. And should she? No. There's no need. All she needs to know is that is that whether it's too hot and then be able to do something about it with the affordance of usability and probably manageability for things like well, the boiler when it goes wrong. Um, there's a reference, Don Norman, The Design of Everyday Things, which talks about this sort of stuff and it defines affordances and that sort of stuff. So that's a very good read, I think, if you're into any area of usability. Um, I think we better sort of counter on or some of the people who asked pre-questions. I mean, we, we will be good. hanging around a bit perhaps afterwards so you can catch us. And anyway, I'm in and out of the Energy Institute quite often if you want any sort of feedback at any time. So the next one is really if people are comfortable at 15 and 16, um, but the engineering standard says you shouldn't be, then what do you do about it? Well, what we do about it is we ask people what we think. And we start with that, and then you make measurements. And if the measurements are surprising, then there's something you have to learn from the measurement, not something that's wrong with the people. Now, this goes back to... I was going to have a whole discussion on this, but I don't think we've got time. But if the person who asked the question makes themselves known to me, I can send them um, a presentation I did on it. Well, just one thing from... In our house, 19 degrees now in June is regarded as comfortably cool. But in January, it's regarded as uncomfortably cool. Not by me, but by Rita. Now... I mean, that, that, that summarizes everything um, in terms of that question. You know, it's, it depends. It, it, um, I, I am completely cool at, at 17, 18. And so what's wrong with that? I don't have, why should I have to conform to a standard? All I need is, is the controllability in order to make things comfortable for me. There's a really good book also for references called Air Conditioning America by Gail Cooper that looks into particularly what happened in the US in the 20s, but then it goes on to the 40s after the war, about pushing air conditioning. And the main reason was moving from subjective to objective standards. So essentially, if an environment didn't meet an objective standard, then comfort as a commodity often wasn't being provided, so you needed kit. And there's a, there's a good issue actually building research and information too, and there's a recent one too, good comfort in a low carbon society. There are a lot of things we take for granted, which as the paradigm is shifting, you go, hang on a moment, why are we doing that? So should we accept a certain amount of control over people's energy use is necessary? Well, the question is really then is whether you're being dictatorial about it or not. I mean, the danger is that you're dictatorial about it. You lock them up in a really unpleasant space. But the danger is often our buildings are dictatorial about it in that they require a larger input of energy than they need in order to be habitable at all. And that's something which one needs to get out of. You want to get something that's, something that's resilient and can degrade gently rather than something that falls off the edge of the map. 
I think we'd better sort of rush on because there's only 10 minutes left now. So, why are other architects so in disengaged? Well, Adrian, you've got an answer to that. Well, the, the key is the word design. What architects are good at is design. They're not, they, that's what they're interested in. That's what their rather odd culture is built to reinforce. But design is not the same as the real world and reality. And one of the things we discover is if, if you apply architectural criteria to the real world, you get some pretty odd responses. Like, one of the reasons I got into architecture in the first place was the new brutalism in the 1960s, which I just hated. Um, because it, it didn't just have design aspects, you know, Dennis Lasden and all that. But it also had human response aspects, which where people really didn't like what they were seeing. They didn't like a lot of concrete. They didn't like high-rise. They didn't like Erno Goldfinger. The architects did, but the rest of the world didn't. Now, that's the sort of thing that, that concerned me. And the thing that you find is that when an architect does go back into a building and you've, you've done a post-occupancy study on it, they will be trying to put the building back into the form that they envisaged it in the first place. I mean, I distinctly remember a toilet, a gent's toilet, forgive me for getting a bit scatological, which was stinking. It was horrible. And a door had been jammed open to ventilate it. And the, the architect came along and just kicked the, the wedge out of the door to shut the door. And the architects are notorious for not liking light switches on walls. They hide them. Or they make things automatic because it's aesthetically offensive to have things on walls, apparently. Now, you know, there's a different mindset, and I'm lampooning this and being obviously slightly unfair to make the point, but they design reality and the user view of buildings is almost completely different. Users want a quiet life and they want to go home um, having done their job well without too much fuss, basically, to put it in one sentence. They don't want some wonderful experience, aesthetic experience every day. They don't want necessarily to reflect in the glories of art or win, or win the competitions. You know, a different, completely different mindset. And when you study users from using post-occupancy studies, um, you get a completely different picture. Read my, my, the thing I did called The Great Escape. I was researching Australian buildings, and it became quite clear in the comments we were getting from the, occup the occupiers that they didn't want to be there. They wanted to be somewhere else, not surprisingly. You know, they want, and the buildings that allowed escape, actually physical escape to get out onto balconies or, or to get away from their colleagues or escape in other, in other senses, were like more. Okay, the in-use RIBA work stage. Well, the interesting thing is that 50 years ago, there was an in-use RIBA work stage in the plan of work. Yes. It was called Stage N, 1962. They threw it out of architect's appointment in 1972. We were at the practice committee in 2002 and persuaded them to put it back in again, but they didn't quite. They made it L3 in the 2008 plan of work. And now it's in the new plan of work. But the thing is, if the culture doesn't change, it won't necessarily turn into the right sort of thing, which is why we're sort of spouting about the new professionalism and say, this is something that you have to do to have the license from society to be, you know, a protected professional. Oh, there's a lovely aside from Robert Vale, who you mentioned before about architects. Why does it take seven years to be an architect? Because it takes that long to forget what ordinary people like. <laughs> <laughs> Next, please. Um, role for installers. Well, mostly, I think, 
installers install the technology, they don't necessarily quite understand it. And there's this whole golden thread for design intent to reality, which means that often the technology that's installed is neither usable intrinsically or usable in detail. So, you know, what you find, as Adrian says, is not usually that the heating programmer is at waste level. It's at waste level sandwiched between the immersion heater and the side of the airing cupboard. You know, so you get, you get these ridiculous things. And building rigs, I think in 2006, required independent programming of heating and hot water, which was just the time when nobody understood anymore how to use their programmer. So what you're getting is even with this very, very basic technology, you know, one device, one boiler, we're not doing it at all well. And now, you know, people are wanting all this extra kit in domestic buildings, you know. Forget it. The only agenda for that is selling more kit and selling more support services in the name of sustainability. Unless we can do it much smarter, it's not going to be sustainable. I mean, we've written quite a lot about this over the years, and part of our frustration is that we were writing about this in the mid in the mid 90s, and nobody took any blind bit of notice. And um, you know, it's coming round again, and um, perhaps they're taking a little bit more notice. But the whole question of usability is a context-dependent thing, and most technologies are, are put in by installers in a context-free way. You know, the installer comes along, they don't understand everything about the building or what it's supposed to be. You don't have a clerk of works to explain how it should be done or interpret it for the client. I mean, there was a classic study that we did uh, many years ago now, which was the body shop. And the body shop, w whenever you do a, a POE, the body shop was saying, we're green, you know, we're environmentally very friendly, we're wonderful. And you, th you think, oh, oh, really, you know, am I going to fall for that one? And so we went to study the, bu the, bu the building in Littlehampton. And Anita Roddick was, had a kind of beaten up old VW that was in the car park, you know, and thinking, hello, this is looking a bit suspicious, uh, pretending, pretending to be hip and cool and all the rest of it. And we don't buy all that stuff, but we do study buildings and we do get the data. And the thing about body shop was that at the time, there was a study being done of lighting controls. And I th Bill had studied, I think, 20, it may have been 30 buildings through their criteria of how well do the automatic control systems work. And body shop um, were rather different in that they, they occupied an air-conditioned building, but they were operating it, as an, I think, as a naturally ventilated building. And they very much did things for themselves. And they were very, very firm about how things should be done. And Bill did the lighting control study. And of all the 30 buildings which were looked at, guess which one, which had no professional input whatsoever in the lighting control system, came out best. It was body shop. And the ones that came out worst were, guess, guess what? Bill will tell you. They were the ones that had been recommended to us by the lighting controls manufacturers as their flagship projects. And they had all the technology and none of the usability. Now this is what we mean about context-free, the lighting control. All they care about is selling the systems, getting them in, and getting the income stream, we whatever have that may be. two minutes and three or four questions, so oh, can sorry. I just do a quick Go canter on. through? Yes. Um, what impact do you think climate will change over building design? Well, a lot, essentially. Is it taken account by those forming policy? Well, it all depends what sort of climate change you expect. I mean, what we've seen is climate change doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be hotter in the UK. It just means it's going to be different in the UK. So I think the whole resilient buildings approach becomes incredibly important. And it's policy-led evidence yeah. or evidence-led yes, policy. Yes, often policy-led evidence, unfortunately. Policy-led evidence is not a good thing. Evidence-led policy is a lot better. We have policy-led evidence at the moment. So, if we can just finish these off, because I think it would be nice to do a thing and we can pick it up. I mean, I call the Green Deal a Green Subprime Deal. I just think there are so many things wrong with it at the moment. And, essentially, 
It's not, again, I mean, a Green Deal often is taking place in existing properties, so you shouldn't be explaining it to the householder. You should be learning from the householder what they want and then providing, you know, what they've got. So it's very much a dialogue which goes through the process. You know, and if you're a social landlord, then you have to articulate that process in a rather different way. But again, we've got to sort of switch to much more of a demand-side culture than a supply-side culture if we're really going to get the virtuous circles going. So, what's the most pressing knowledge gap? I think this is the final question. Yes. And I think, Adrian, you have a very quick answer to this. And the then a couple of slides uh, determine it. Two words, the, or three words, the real world. Is study the real world. Don't go virtuous. So go virtuous, don't go virtual. And there's a lovely book by Colin Robson called Real World Research, which sets out a number of differences between things that make a difference in the real world and things that are fit for academic study. Now, fortunately, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the boundaries are loosening on academic study, but essentially, what's of interest to academe and what's useful for practice have been too long, too far apart. So we saw, for example, 40 years ago, a book called Building Performance was published by the Building Performance Research Unit in Strathclyde, which had done some amazing work for four years in schools. Academic Research Unit, supported by the Ministry of Edu Education, published in the Architects' Journal, supported by half a dozen design practices. When the book got published, essentially that was the end. It wasn't the beginning. Why? Because, and it says in the preface, as academics, we should be developing theories more than influencing practice. No, terribly sorry. You need to influence practice, and quite often you don't need a theory of everything to make a really useful difference. So I'll finish on just one reference, which Tanch said should be required reading for all his research students, but I don't know whether it happened, and I'm sorry, I've lost the reference off the bottom of it. But case studies are not just anecdotal. Case studies are the canaries in the coal mine that allow you to get traction on things that might be able to improve buildings in use. So thank you very much and wishing you well for all your studies. And sorry we couldn't have more of a one-to-one -one dialogue this afternoon, but the time got shorter and shorter. Thanks.